So I want to acknowledge that we're hosting this session on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Coast Salish peoples. That includes the territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish and the Tsleil-Waututh Nations, and the Métis Chartered Community of the Lower Mainland Region. And all of you around the province are in your ter are uh, on your territories and, and land um, and appreciative of that and the things that we learn from the land and with the people on it. Next slide. So it really gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Sagar Nigwakar. Um, Dr. Nigwakar is the co-director of the Kidney Research Center at the Mass General Hospital, an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard, and is the medical director of the Chelsea uh, Kidney Care Facility. He's actually from uh, India originally and had his medical degree from the University of Mumbai and a master's in medical science from Harvard Medical School. He trained in nephrology at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and uh, in their joint nephrology program with the Brigham and Women's and Mass General. So he conducts translational research in vascular disorders with, in people with kidney disease and has an international reputation for his clinical and research uh, work in calciphylaxis. He's actually in charge of a multidisciplinary uh, calciphylaxis team at the Mass General and has uh, over 100 publications in very high impact journals. So it's really going to be fascinating for us to learn this rare but rather devastating condition that we see in our patients. And so we're really very much looking forward. So thank you for making the time and uh, over to you. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. And it's a great honor to uh, speak with all of you about calciphylaxis. I uh, really hope this will be interactive. So I feel that I have a lot to learn from you guys. And of course, share with you our perspectives um, regarding this uh, rare disease, um, calciphylaxis. So <clears throat> what I thought I will do in the next um, um, uh, 45, 50 minutes or so is to uh, go over uh, uh, the diseases, uh, epidemiology, pathobiology, as we currently understand, and outline some of the management uh, principles uh, that we have learned and have shared through publications as part of our uh, multidisciplinary team approach uh, to calciphylaxis. I have, uh, these are the main objectives, uh, which I just, uh, I just outlined. And I will also add, I'm quite excited that, you know, finally, uh, we are now seeing um, uh, some emerging uh, clinical trials, including randomized clinical trials uh, to evaluate uh, potential uh, therapies, uh, their safety, as well as efficacy for individuals who have calciphylaxis. So of course, I will also highlight some of the ongoing work in that, uh, in that area. I have uh, these disclosures. Uh, I will be discussing off-label use of a medication known as sodium thiosulfate, and our research program has received grant funding from Hope Pharmaceuticals, who is one of the manufacturers of sodium thiosulfate in the United States. Um, I also have served as a consultant uh, to Sanifit, which is currently running uh, a clinical trial of SNF472 for uh, calciphylaxis patients. So my interest uh, uh, in this uh, rare disease uh, started, I would say, maybe around uh, 10, 15 years ago at this point. Uh, during chief residency in uh, in Rochester, in New York, uh, where I was uh, following a, 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 a woman who had uh, uh, long-standing diabetes um, uh, and had developed a non-healing, uh, painful leg ulcer. And initial suspicion for uh, that presentation was uh, thought to be kind of a diabetic uh, ulcer. Uh, uh, and at one point in her clinical course, she was sent to the operating room for the for a debridement. And uh, pathologist who looked at the uh, depleted skin tissue uh, uh, called me and asked me who is the nephrologist seeing that patient. And I said, uh, there was no nephrologist following that person, that patient at that time. Uh, I was an internist and uh, her kidney function as far as I could tell was relatively intact. Um, but I was very curious regarding the origin of that question about why a nephrologist should be evaluating this patient. Um, uh, and the pathologist said the skin tissue has features that are suggestive of uh, calciphylaxis. And that was the first time I had heard about uh, that entity and it piqued my interest to really understand what is going on in the cutaneous tissues that is presenting, that is making this woman present with this quite painful non-healing ulcer. 
Uh, the long story short, that particular patient through evaluation was determined to have uh, primary hyperparathyroidism uh, leading to episodes of hypercalcemia. And in her case, after the surgical excision of the parathyroid adenoma, um, uh, many weeks into that, eventually that skin ulcer uh, healed. And then we reported that as a case report and also looked into the literature at that point and identified, uh, I think around 40 or so patients who, had, uh, who were described in the literature to have calciphylaxis in the setting of relatively intact kidney function. And then to move that story forward, even subsequently I joined nephrology fellowship and during fellowship saw a number of individuals who were on dialysis developing this complication. Um, and then under the mentorship of um, uh, Ravi Thadani uh, built this research as well as clinical program dedicated to calciphylaxis. And a lot of our work was recently summarized in a, in a narrative review that we were asked to submit to the journal uh, on the topic of um, calciphylaxis. So I'll give you a, a kind of an overview of how this unfolded, and of course, uh, uh, include contributions from a number of other investigators and clinicians uh, in the world who have contributed significantly to the understanding of this disease, including uh, your very, very own Dr. Levine. So um, uh, current understanding of the definition of calciphylaxis, we have uh, 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 kind of a international consensus panel dedicated to understanding calciphylaxis. And one thing that I have realized uh, through those meetings is there is hardly any consensus when it comes to the topic of calciphylaxis. In terms of the definition, at least the definition that I think of calciphylaxis is what is highlighted on this, on this slide, disorder of microvascular calcification and occlusion involving subcutaneous adipose tissue and dermis uh, uh, that leads to presentations with painful uh, skin lesions. The, uh, the site of uh, vascular involvement is quite peculiar in this disease, and almost always uh, the blood vessels that are in the that are surrounded by the uh, adipose tissues uh, are the ones that are uh, typically involved. And the involvement, of course, um, uh, uh, presents with uh, histologically at least with calcification of the intima as well as the media, um, uh, and in many cases thrombus, as shown in the panel uh, K. On this, on this slide. In the early part of the presentation, the disease can be relatively, uh, the, the patients have relatively benign looking skin lesions. It may be just simple erythema, induration, or a nodule as shown in the panels A, B, C, uh, or even D, you know, where it looks like, like cellulitis type of features. But these lesions have, are painful from the get-go and typically within a matter of days to weeks will progress uh, to become uh, an ulcer as shown in the images E uh, and F. For reasons that are not entirely clear, the, uh, the lesions tend to aggregate around the areas of thick adiposity, so lower abdomen, uh, buttocks, uh, thighs, uh, breasts in women are the areas that are more likely to be involved than compared to more distal body areas like digits or toes. Having said that, um, we and others have described a number of cases now where the involvement was, you know, in the acral areas, digits, toes, including penile involvement from calciphylaxis. But the distribution in terms of central versus peripheral is approximately 70% of the patients have at least some central involvement and 30% individuals have only peripheral uh, involvement. Um, the, the patients with calciphylaxis, especially those who have developed this complication in the setting of end-stage kidney disease have diffused cardiovascular calcification. So if you look at uh, images I and J, which are radiographs, I is a mammogram and J is just a plain radiograph from a patient with calciphylaxis. What you see is, you know, thick uh, or heavily calcified uh, blood vessels. So in panel J, you see a femoral artery running parallel to the fe femur bone and looks, you know, uh, one may argue that looks in, in many areas as radiodense as the, as the bone. And you also see diffuse calcifications in the cutaneous, subcutaneous body parts. In panel I, this is a mammogram from a patient who had developed breast calciphylaxis. And in addition to the, uh, to the necrosed area, which is, which is highlighted in that oval shape, we also see um, uh, the white markings, which are not actually external markings, but rather calcified microvessels within the breast tissue. Histologically, in addition to the calcified blood vessels, 
uh, and thrombosed blood vessels in the subcutaneous adipose areas. Uh, many reports now have described uh, calcifications of the adipocytes itself and also calcification of the uh, other cutaneous and nexal structures, including nerves and the sweat glands uh, in, these, in these patients. Keep in mind though, none of these uh, histological features per se are diagnostic of calciphylaxis. Uh, we and others have now uh, published papers where skin tissues from dialysis patients who had no obvious manifestations of calciphylaxis were examined and not consistently, uh, but you know, we have seen calcifications of the blood vessels of the cutaneous tissues, even in dialysis patients who did not have any cutaneous manifestation of calciphylaxis, such as pain or any kind of uh, obvious skin lesion. Now, does this, does that, um, do, do those calcifications, you know, maybe they're subclinical and maybe some of these patients will subsequently develop calciphylaxis remains to be seen. But at the same time, I think the point I wanted to make was by itself, histology is not diagnostic. And in my clinical experience, I use histology primarily to rule out the mimics of calciphylaxis, such as vasculitis or warfarin necrosis or uh, uh, atherosclerotic uh, uh, diseases and not use it so much to kind of confirm uh, uh, or rule in uh, the diagnosis of, uh, of calciphylaxis. Unfortunately, the mortality in this condition is quite high, 50 to 80% uh, at one year uh, in many reports. And that number is particularly true for dialysis patients who develop calciphylaxis. In non-dialysis patients who develop this complication, the mortality is, is uh, relatively lower maybe around 35 to 40 percent at that number. The table on the left side here uh, summarizes uh, experience from the Mayo Clinic uh, where they had identified 101 patients with calciphylaxis. Uh, as you see, a majority of the patients here uh, are women. And that's an, that's, a, that's an observation that is now, uh, uh, that is reproduced or, or has, observed, has been observed consistently across many cohorts and including all the international registries. Again, the reason for this uh, female uh, uh, predilection uh, is, is, is not clear. In the Mayo Clinic experience of those 100 or so patients that they had, 62% um, uh, had, um, uh, had CKD stage five and so the remaining ones had either milder degrees of CKD or no CKD. In our registry, we have seen uh, close to 85 to 90% of individuals who have developed calciphylaxis have end-stage kidney disease and, and all of, almost all of them are on dialysis. And the remaining 10 to 15% are the ones who have either milder degrees of CKD or sometimes completely normal uh, kidney function. But, but proportionally, that is a much smaller cohort. Obesity is common in these individuals, around 70% in the Mayo Clinic experience were obese, 50% had diabetes. And warfarin uh, as, a, as a therapy for, uh, as a, for, for, for indications like AFib or DVTs uh, was present in approximately 60% of the patients in the Mayo Clinic experience. In our registry, we have seen that number around 30%, so not as high as 60, uh, but clearly uh, 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 warfarin use is common among individuals who subsequently develop calciphylaxis. And we'll get into the details in terms of what is the potential pathobiology of that epidemiological observation. On the right side, we have uh, a summary from the, uh, from the review article that we wrote on calciphylaxis that gets into not only some of these commonly described risk associations for calciphylaxis, but also relatively uncommon risk associations, including uh, thrombophilic disorders, such as lupus anticoagulant, for example, uh, or certain autoimmune conditions like lupus, for example, certain cancer uh, disorders have been linked with um, non-uremic calciphylaxis presentations, as well as some genetic polymorphisms in the, uh, in the NT5V gene that I will get into a little bit more detail. When you see calciphylaxis, we of course will focus most of the today's presentation in calciphylaxis, uh, in, on, on patients with calciphylaxis who have end-stage kidney disease, but just one slide on, um, uh, on patients who develop this condition in the absence of any kidney disease. Uh, again, in, even in that cohort, uh, female sex is, is dominant. Warfarin use around 50%, 33% uh, were obese in an experience that we described um, a couple of years ago at this point. Um, so in some ways, uh, the risk factors kind of overlap 
even though uh, patients with non uremic calciphylaxis you know do not have end stage uh, kidney disease and histologically um, uh, uh, the disease uh, is kind of uh, is indistinguishable between the non uremic and the uremic um, calciphylaxis it's quite interesting if you go across the globe and try to plot the uh, frequency of calciphylaxis we saw we see some differences and this table summarizes uh, some of those uh, some of those data um, the very first uh, uh, row here is a, is a is a is a is a study that is now uh, uh, almost uh, two decades old uh, a single center study uh, 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 that was focused on individuals both on hemo and peritoneal dialysis and reported the frequency of calciphylaxis as 45 cases per 1000 patient years uh, this is a canadian study that number has not been subsequently replicated in any of the recent studies and this was as i mentioned a single center study a relatively small study uh, a study that we conducted in collaboration with one of the large commercial dialysis organization in the us known as fresenius um, uh, we we gathered the frequency as 3.5 new cases per 1000 patient years and this was this was in hemodialysis patient population but if i go across the pond and look at the german calciphylaxis registry that vincent brandenburg leads uh, that frequency drops to around 0.4 new cases per 1000 patient years and if you travel further east and go to japan uh, the numbers drop drop even further and in japan the frequency is less than 0.1 new case of calciphylaxis per 1000 patient years the exact reasons for this uh, different frequencies is not clear but of course uh, uh, it's interesting to note um, uh, uh, because there are considerable differences in terms of dialysis delivery some of the nutritional aspects across the continents and whether those are linked with calciphylaxis origin or not remains to be seen um, of course you know the, the, the as i mentioned many patients with calciphylaxis have obesity uh, and just the obesity prevalence is very different between japan and the United States, and whether that has anything to do with the disease frequency of calciphylaxis is something that we are quite interested in investigating. In the EVOLVE trial, which is, which as many of you know, was a large uh, randomized control trial focused on hemodialysis patients, uh, which was trying to address the issue regarding the uh, efficacy and the safety of calcium emetics, in calcite in particular. Uh, for patients who had moderate to severe hyperparathyroidism. And calciphylaxis was not a primary outcome of that disease, but was collected as one of the safety outcomes. And in that experience of close to 4,000 dialysis patients, the frequency was around three new cases of calciphylaxis per 1,000 patient years. So pretty comparable to what we have seen in the United States. A small a single center cohort study from our group looked at the PD patients prevalence of or incidence of calciphylaxis. And in that experience, we, we observed the frequency at around nine new cases per thousand patient years. So it seems to be slightly higher. But when we look at our patient cohort that did develop calciphylaxis while, while being on PD, uh, many of those patients had arrived to PD after uh, not either tolerating hemodialysis or or not able to uh, achieve the adequacy parameters or, or had some access issues with hemodialysis, for example. So I'm not sure whether it's the modality that drives the disease or is it just the patient's overall uh, comorbidities and other um, uh, aspects such as hyperparathyroidism, for example, that is driving the disease. There is a suggestion from the US RDS data registry that the frequency of the disease may be, may be on the rise, uh, but that is uh, only in the in the US uh, that we have seen. Uh, so uh, in the early part of my fellowship, we started collecting the skin tissue specimens from calciphylaxis patients and started interrogating them with techniques such as Raman spectroscopy and micro CT scans. And what we saw was that the deposits that are seen in patients who have calciphylaxis, the cutaneous deposits are calcium hydroxyapatite. So calcium combined with, with phosphate, uh, very similar to what we see in other types of um, vascular calcifications among dialysis uh, dialysis patients. The history of the disease is actually quite interesting and the origin of the term, uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is first described in 1960s uh, by Professor uh, Saley, who had interest in studying the mechanisms of hypersensitivity, anaphylaxis, and at one point in his uh, laboratory career, he had developed a two-step uh, model where he first sensitized the animals by either causing uremia uh, 
or giving these animals high dose PTH extract or high phosphate diet. And then um, uh, 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 after a period of three to four days, we challenged the animal skin by either causing some local skin trauma or using some metallic salts. And the animal skin developed this uh, cutaneous mold. And when you looked at the uh, uh, deposits uh, or he looked at the histology of that, of that skin, he saw a lot of calcium. So he combined the term calcium and phylaxis to call it calciphylaxis. But the, and soon after that, there were reports in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in medical journals about patients presenting with non-healing ulcers. And when those, when skin tissues were examined from those, those patients, again, calcium deposits were seen. And there were some comparisons made between this animal model of calciphylaxis and the human disease and the term, uh, and the disease became known as calciphylaxis. But we know that first of all, calciphylaxis is not a hypersensitivity reaction in the, in the strictest sense of anaphylaxis. And also, uh, uh, unlike the animal skin, uh, uh, where, the, where there is no involvement of the blood vessels, the human disease is characterized by ischemic uh, 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 skin uh, uh, injury. So at present, we do not have an animal model that accurately recapitulates uh, the human uh, calciphylaxis disease. Uh, but because of the historical significance, uh, the term calciphylaxis is still very commonly used. Although there have been uh, kind of promotions for other terms, such as calcific uremic arteriolopathy, CUA, um, uh, to describe calciphylaxis that, that occurs in patients who have end-stage uh, kidney disease. So what is the pathogenesis of, the, of this calcium uh, phosphate deposits in calciphylaxis? And again, the whole story, I think, is, is yet, to be, yet to be written. But the most uh, accepted thought process at this point in the field is the disease is caused because of imbalance between the calcification inhibitors and the calcification promoters. And the three main inhibitors that we and others have studied are one is matrix clar protein, uh, the second one is fetuin A, and the third one is, is pyrophosphate. So we'll talk a little bit about matrix clar protein where most of the literature is currently, currently focused on. But my presentation uh, in terms of the pathogenesis will focus on uh, the, the explanation for calcification in the origin of calciphylaxis. But equally, I believe um, important process is thrombosis. Uh, and again, we have very limited to no insights into why these blood vessels uh, uh, develop thrombosis. Is it because of the endothelial damage? Is it because uh, the patients have inherent tendency for, uh, for systemic thrombophilia? Or is it something else? And again, that is something that you know, for trainees in this, in this group, if somebody wants to understand that, that would be, I think, a very nice research um, uh, project uh, to build upon. But I will focus on some of the inhibitors of calcification in the next few slides. So before I get to that, I wanted to highlight the epidemiological link between warfarin use and calciphylaxis. And we looked at this uh, uh, four or five years ago at this point in that large um, uh, regist in the large uh, registry study that we had developed uh, in collaboration with the Fresenius Medical Care North America. So there we had uh, over 1,000 patients with calciphylaxis. They were all chronic hemodialysis patients. We matched them to controls who did not have calciphylaxis, and those uh, matching was done in terms of age, sex, race. What we observed was patients who developed calciphylaxis, uh, 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 they were taking warfarin, uh, uh, at the time of dialysis initiation. And those who were taking warfarin had three to four times higher odds of subsequent development of calciphylaxis compared to those individuals who were not taking warfarin. So this was, of course, not the first uh, study to describe the link between warfarin and calciphylaxis, but uh, what probably was, remains to be one of the largest study. And also, unlike many other studies that had studied, uh, that had looked at the exposure at the time of development of calciphylaxis. In this particular study, we looked at the exposure three to four years before the calciphylaxis developed. Uh, we also saw uh, associations between parameters like serum calcium, serum phosphorus, uh, parathyroid hormone levels. Um, and as you can see, those are highlighted in this, in this green box. But warfarin association was quite striking uh, with over three to four or times odds of developing subsequent um, calciphylaxis among warfarin, uh, uh, among individuals who are taking warfarin. We kind of move that story a little bit forward by 
trying to understand what's going in the circulation uh, from uh, in patients who have calciphylaxis. So over the years, we have developed uh, this calciphylaxis registry and bio repository. Uh, and in this uh, particular experience, we studied 20 patients who had calciphylaxis. They were all chronic dialysis patients. Um, and then we had controls who were also chronic dialysis patients without calciphylaxis, and they were matched in terms of age, race, sex, and warfarin. And we interrogated uh, warfarin being one of it being the vitamin K antagonist, we were interested in understanding the, uh, uh, the, 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 the metabolism of vitamin K as it pertains to calciphylaxis. So we, in, we kind of ran the blood samples for vitamin K deficiency using a assay known as PIVCA. And we also studied this protein known as matrix GLA protein, which is a vitamin K dependent protein uh, around 83 amino acids produced in the endothelium as well as chondrocytes. And its job is to uh, inhibit calcification when it is activated using a gamma carboxylation process that requires vitamin K as a cofactor. So our hypothesis was patients who have vitamin K deficiency, either because of antagonism, because of warfarin use, or because of other aspects like nutrition, for example, will not be able to carboxylate matrix club protein. Um, because carboxylation requires vitamin K as a cofactor. And because of this deficiency of carboxylation, patients will have increased risk for calcifications. Um, so we looked at these blood samples. And as you see in this slide, uh, patients who had calcifylaxis had almost universally a deficiency uh, of vitamin K defined by the PIVCA acid. Now the vitamin K deficiency was also present among the controls, around 40, 50% of the controls had vitamin K deficiency. Uh, and many of these individuals were on uh, uh, warfarin therapy. So some of their deficiency may be originating from that. But in terms of the prevalence, uh, the, the much, much more higher, prevalence was much higher in, in calciphylaxis cases compared to the controls. And that, that uh, association held true even after excluding patients who were taking warfarin as shown in the panel on the right hand side. Of course, the numbers are quite small. The whole cohort had 40 patients, 20 cases, 20 controls. And when we excluded the warfarin exposed patients, we had 14 cases and 14 uh, controls. More importantly, I thought the activity of the matrix club protein was, was reduced among patients who had calciphylaxis compared to the controls. Um, and this, this, again, relationship held true even after excluding patients who had calcifiers. Now, this is a cross-sectional study, um, uh, so it's, it's, of course, impossible to, uh, to derive causality. Uh, but kind of just building upon that epidemiological experience of vitamin K antagonism, namely warfarin and the development of calcifylaxis, this kind of piece provided uh, 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 another piece of information uh, to, that, to that story of whether vitamin K deficiency is in some ways linked to calcifylaxis. To move that story forward, we and others also started looking into the uh, skin tissues uh, of pa from patients who have calcifylaxis. And Vincent Brandenburg's group did these experiments where he looked at the uh, 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 expression of um, uh, BMP2 uh, and RENX2 uh, in skin tissues from calcifylaxis. And of course, BMP2 is, uh, is uh, one of the promoters of calcification. And in fact, matrix GLA protein uh, inhibits the activity of BMP2. And RENX2 is, is a gene involved in the, in the calcification process. So what his group observed was the both the BMP2 and the RENX2 were upregulated in cutaneous tissues of patients with calcifylaxis. They also did some preliminary interrogation of the matrix GLA protein activity in the skin tissue. And that seemed to suggest that the carboxylated matrix GLA protein activity was lower among patients who had calcifylaxis compared to the controls. But again, limited experience at this point, um, as is true for many other rare diseases. We also have looked into the skin tissues uh, and have observed uh, uh, findings very similar to what Dr. Brandenburg's group had observed. We did not stain specifically for uh, BMP2, but we looked at some of the intermediates of that BMP2 pathway, namely PSMAD158, and saw that those, those intermediates are again upregulated, and we had uh, we we we've had a similar observation um, uh, for patients uh, for, for, on skin tissues from patients who had calciphylaxis and those who were on dialysis, and also uh, patients who um, uh, who were not on dialysis but had developed calciphylaxis. Interestingly, in a couple of those uh, 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 skin tissue specimens, uh, 
uh, we saw actually upregulation of the PSMAD uh, intermediates, even in the absence of obvious cutaneous uh, skin calcification. Um, so suggesting that maybe this could be potentially used as one of the early markers for, for calcifolysis. But of course, again, at this point, we have very limited, uh, limited data, but maybe in future, because one of the clinical limitations of biopsies has been the pathologist sometimes is not able to find um, calci calcium deposits in those biopsies, and that in some cases leads to uh, either falsely negative diagnosis or requirement of a repeat biopsy uh, to kind of to, to rule in uh, the diagnosis of calcium deposits. So we, we feel that something like um, uh, uh, BMP2 pathway intermediate may serve um, uh, to, to address that uh, unmaking. But of course, the natural question was if the uh, vitamin K antagonist epidemiological links with the development of calcifolaxis, if circulating levels of carboxylated MGP are lower in calcifolaxis, if the skin tissue shows upregulation of BMP2 and RENX2, then can you actually um, uh, 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 intervene in this disease process by using high dose vitamin K? And so that was one of the um, uh, rationales. Uh, that we had to when we started designing a randomized controlled trial of uh, vitamin K1 supplementation for patients with calcifolaxis. So of course, vitamin K comes in many, many different forms. The most dominant circulating form is vitamin K1, which is phylloquinone, which mostly comes from um, uh, green leafy vegetables. Uh, the animal form, which is the menoquinone 4 and menoquinone 7, uh, are of course uh, quite important. Um, uh, in terms of all the um, uh, actions of vitamin K, particularly the actions related to the calcification uh, inhibition. Uh, but vitamin K1 does get converted to the vitamin K2, and we decided to use vitamin K1 in our, uh, in our clinical trial. Um, we used a pretty high dose of around 10 milligram uh, of phyto phytonadione uh, 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 orally uh, uh, to be taken three times a week after dialysis. And we just actually wrapped up uh, that clinical trial we presented this at the last ASN as one of the late breaking abstracts. And I'm hoping we will have uh, 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 published uh, uh, publication from that trial very soon. Uh, essentially, uh, this is a, the, the trial. Uh, this was one of the very first clinical trials of, of uh, for calcifolaxis patients. Uh, it was a placebo controlled randomized trial. We, we had 13 patients uh, who, who got randomized to the active intervention, 13 patients got placebo. The trial was primarily designed to establish the feasibility as well as the safety of, um, of the vitamin K supplementation in this patient population, which seems to be reasonably uh, safe. Um, we did collect information about efficacy in terms of the matrix clar protein levels, as well as some of the clinical characteristics like pain intensity and the skin lesion improvement. And efficacy, at least in terms of the bio, biochemical, biological efficacy for matrix club protein activation seems to be pretty, pretty robust. And I hope uh, to have that uh, trial fully presented and published in the near future. But what about, uh, what about the genetics? And do we have any insights from uh, disorder, genetic disorders of calcification that can inform our uh, inquiry? for calci calcifolysis. So uh, uh, many of you may be familiar with this uh, pyrophosphate and ENPP1 pathway, which is involved in the metabolism of ATP. Uh, essentially, the ENPP1 enzyme is required for the conversion of ATP into AMP and the pyrophosphate. And the pyrophosphate is one of the, again, inhibitors of, um, of calcification, including vascular calcification. And Vincent Brandenburg's group has described polymorphisms in the uh, in some of the enzymes involved in the ENP1 pathway, they are overexpressed in patients with uh, calcifolaxis. Of course, the functional significance is yet to be determined, but needless, but, but suffices to say that uh, this is a very important, I think, pathway primarily because uh, it is also druggable. Uh, bisphosphonates, for example, are pyrophosphate analogs, and there are anecdotal case reports and some cohort studies from from Spain that describe the potential effectiveness of uh, bisphosphonate treatment in the in the management of uh, calcifolaxis. But you may be wondering by now, you know, we, we have so many dialysis patients who have these demographic characteristics. Uh, uh, they are on warfarin, they have diabetes, many of them are obese, but 
obviously calciphylaxis is, is an extraordinarily rare complication. So what is it that triggers calciphylaxis in some patients and, and is, is, is not there for other patients to, uh, to bring on calciphylaxis? So again, the, the full insight is, is unclear, but one of the interests that we have is to study uh, the, the, the implications of recurrent skin trauma into the origin of calciphylaxis. And this is an epidemiological observation we have made and published a few years ago in Jason, where we focused on patients who had diabetes and had developed calciphylaxis and looked at the, uh, uh, the, uh, looked at the, the, the typical sites for insulin administration, such as lower abdomen and thighs, and compared the, uh, the frequency of calciphylaxis in relation to the, uh, the skin trauma frequency from insulin injections. And again, this is epidemiological study, so causality cannot be confirmed. But we see a stepwise increase in the odds of calciphylaxis development as the uh, frequency of insulin injections increase. And this was um, uh, seen in univariate analysis, but also in the multivariable analysis that controlled for factors such as uh, uh, diabetes control, for example. I previously mentioned that uh, you know the, the skin lesions tend to aggregate around the areas of thick adiposity, and also the blood vessel involvement seems to be uh, uh, in the in the subcutaneous adipose area. So, what is it about the adipocytes that we know at this point in relation to calciphylaxis? So, Sharon Moore's group has done some very elegant work in this area, where they have shown that when when adipocytes are exposed to uh, to high phosphate environment, they actually calcify. Uh, they change their gene expression. So they, they, the, the expression of adipogenic genes goes down and the expression of, uh, of, 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 uh, of skeletal genes or bone genes uh, goes up in those adipocytes that are, that are exposed to, uh, to calcification, calcifying media. Um, and interestingly, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, if, if the vascular smooth muscle cells uh, I'm sorry, if, if, the, if the adipocytes are exposed to the, uh, this calcif calcifying media, uh, and if you, uh, if you study vascular smooth muscle cells in the, in the same petri dish, uh, the adipocytes unidirectionally actually can calcify the vascular smooth muscle cells, but not vice versa, suggesting that there may be some paracrine mechanism that leads to calcification of vascular smooth muscle cells from the calcified uh, adipocytes. And I, one of the uh, experiments that Sharon Moore's group did uh, in this, in this, uh, in the same uh, described in the same paper is when those adipocytes that were uh, that were prone to calcify because of exposure to the calcifying media were exposed to sodium thiosulfate, uh, they observed that the calcification was significantly attenuated both for adipocytes and also for the vascular smooth muscle cells. And of course, you know, sodium thiosulfate is one of the most commonly uh, used, uh, of course, off-label treatment for calciphylaxis. At this time, its efficacy as well as safety is, is unclear, but there are a number of uh, case reports, uh, case series type of publications, and also some cohort studies that suggest that uh, this medication may be safe as well as may have some effectiveness in the treatment of pain of calciphylaxis as well as uh, accelerate the healing of uh, calciphylaxis condition. So again, it's a not, uh, there is no approved therapy for calciphylaxis, uh, but, uh, but sodium thiosulfate infusions uh, is one of the most commonly used um, off-label therapies of calciphylaxis. The mechanism is unclear. One possibility may be this, um, uh, this anti-calcification property that Dr. Sharon Moore's group observed, but there have been other speculations in terms of its vasodilatory properties uh, and also some anti inflammatory properties. And of course, you know, unfortunately, uh, as is true for many rare diseases, uh, randomized trials are frequently lacking. So evidence comes from mostly from uh, case reports, case series, and some retrospective cohort studies. This is a summary of data of thiosulfate uh, that seems to suggest that in overwhelming majority of the patients, thiosulfate seems to be uh, effective. But it's important to remember that these studies are all retrospective um, and, and frequently don't have a control on it. The therapy also, the thiosulfate therapy also has some significant side effects. Around 20, 25% of the patients may develop nausea, vomiting, volume overload is a concern. Each 25 gram dose that is frequently used does introduce uh, around six grams of sodium load uh, 
uh, not increased anion gap metabolic acidosis is observed in around 30% of the patients, and then hypocalcemia and QTC prolongation are some of the other concerns with this, with this therapy. And more importantly, uh, although we don't have a randomized controlled trial data, uh, uh, a recent uh, meta-analysis um, of, of therapies uh, targeted for calciprolaxis did look at thiosulfate uh, and its uh, potential effectiveness and safety uh, from studies that had patients, so some of who had received thiosulfate and some of who, who had not received thiosulfate. And in that experience, as you can see in that, in that, in that red uh, rectangle that I have highlighted, the rates of amputation, uh, uh, lesion, skin lesion worsening, and mortality uh, were not different among patients who received thiosulfate infusions compared to those who did not. So although we use this medication frequently, at this point, I'm not convinced that this, is, um, this has uh, uh, sufficient efficacy for all patients with calcium. There may be some subset of patients who may respond uh, to this therapy, uh, but as, as a group, I don't think so. We have evidence to, uh, to, to, to kind of conclude that thiosulfate has, uh, has a definitive role. But unfortunately, other therapies like sinacalcate, hyperbaric oxygen, bisphosphonates, parathyroidectin, we have all been looked at, uh, but in the same meta-analysis, none of them seem to have clear benefit uh, and again, this meta-analysis was focused on studies that were all retrospective uh, and had a control arm, but we do not have a randomized control trial data for any of the currently routinely used medications. Thiosulfate can also be used intralegionally, and we have a protocol for that. And especially for patients who have early lesions, this can be potentially uh, effective treatment, uh, can avoid the systemic toxicity of thiosulfate infusions. Because there is equipoise in the field in terms of the efficacy and the safety of thiosulfate infusions for calciphylaxis, our group actually did uh, plan and start a randomized controlled trial uh, known as Calista trial uh, for calciphylaxis patients. Unfortunately, during the pandemic, uh, we could not recruit uh, a patient. This was designed as a placebo controlled randomized controlled trial, so I had many challenges, and this trial was unfortunately terminated uh, early. Uh, but I still have hope in terms of getting some data uh, on thiosulfate's efficacy and safety. And an uh, uh, Australian group led by Mick Jardin has just embarked on a uh, uh, clinical trial known as Beat Calci that's going to assess in a smart design fashion three interventions for calciphylaxis, sodium thiosulfate, vitamin K2, and magnesium. And I think this trial is just uh, getting underway now. And hopefully, we'll have results from this very soon. A novel compound known as SNF472, which is a phytate compound, uh, is also being studied uh, for calciphylaxis. And the sponsor known as Sanifit has completed a phase two trial where they have, they have seen uh, improvement in the pain scores as well as improvement in the, in the skin, uh, 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 improvement in the wound healing rates among patients who received the SNF472 compound. Uh, but the previous experience of that uh, of, uh, in that trial is all open label and not, there was no control arm. And a phase three study now that has a control arm is currently underway. And we at uh, our site is, is one of the participating locations for this site. There are, of course, a number of registries across the world for this disease. In the US, we have this partners, Calciphylaxis Biobank, that allows for remote participation. Uh, there, is a, there, is a, there are a number of European registry. There is also a registry in the United Kingdom led by Dr. Smita Sinha. And of course, I really encourage you to, to, to you know, if, you, if there's a register, I'm not familiar about the register in the Canada, but if there is one, to really uh, refer patients to that because that would be the best way to learn uh, about these diseases, biology and the risk factors and develop future treatments, especially considering we do not have an animal model that recapitulates the disease pathology. At present, what do we have? Even though we don't have an approved therapy, uh, we and others have kind of developed this kind of a multidisciplinary team approach that includes inputs from many specialists, dermatology, nephrology, uh, dermatopathology, radiology, pain specialists, uh, wound specialists, and also nutrition and palliative care specialists. And uh, even though this, uh, uh, this uh, approach um, uh, you know, is, is based on I'm sorry about this background noise. I hope you can still hear me. Um, uh, but uh, uh, even though we don't have uh, approved therapy, we at least are able to offer 
a consistent uh, guideline and advice to the patient population and not introduce a lot of discordance because it was not uncommon, at least at our center, for a dermatologist to stop by at the patient's bedside and recommend against even a procedure such as a punch biopsy. And the, you know, within an hour or so, a surgeon will stop by and tell the patient that uh, you can undergo debridement uh, for the skin lesion. And patient used to be confused, you know, on one hand, you are worried about skin trauma from a biopsy, and the other hand, you're you're okaying the debridement procedure. So we have you know, at least developed some general, I would say, guidance uh, and a team-based approach that offers a consistent uh, recommendation to a patient who has calciphylaxis. Debridement, on the other hand, I think, is an important part of treatment of calciphylaxis, uh, as, uh, especially for patients who have infected skin lesions and those patients who have uh, heavy necrotic burden from calciphylaxis. <clears throat> Uh, just a couple of words about biopsy before I open up for questions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, biopsy per se uh, does not have, may not have diagnostic features. So we use it primarily to rule out the mimics that are listed on this slide. Um, uh, uh, those conditions that may present with very similar presentations to calciphylaxis. Um, in general, we are avoiding excision biopsies um, because of the risk of non-healing ulcer as well as infection of those sites. Um, what we and others mostly do nowadays is a, is a punch biopsy using a telescope technique where the first punch uh, goes around three to four millimeter deep and the second punch is introduced through the first punch uh, to get to that additional three, four millimeter depth uh, to essentially approach the subcutaneous adipose tissue areas. And we feel, we feel that the yield is pretty good with that approach um, um, and the risk of complications such as non-healing ulcer or infection uh, is, is, almost, um, is almost zero. With that, with that approach. Uh, of course, the calcium is something that the pathologist is interested in finding out. Uh, it may not be detected on a routine H&E stain. Uh, so if there is a suspicion for calciphylaxis, it always helps to prompt the pathologist to do some special stains, such as alizarin red for calcium or von Cosa for phosphate to detect those calcium phosphate deposits. Imaging studies have been described in the literature uh, to, to diagnose calciphylaxis, but in my opinion, at least they lack the desired sensitivity and specificity. So at this point, we do not routinely uh, recommend imaging studies to diagnose uh, calciphylaxis. A word about bisphosphonates. Uh, these are pyrophosphate analogs uh, and a, a number of, I guess, case reports, case series, and a couple of cohort studies from, from Spanish investigators describe their potential effectiveness in calciphylaxis. We, in our protocol, use it as a second line treatment. So we first start with a multidisciplinary approach that includes infusions of sodium thiosulfate. We typically um, give 25 gram dose three times a week in hemodialysis patient, uh, and we reassess them at around four to five week interval. At that point, if there is absolutely no improvement in the pain and no improvement in the skin lesion, um, we frequently then look into the second line therapies such as bisphosphonate infusions or addition of hyperbaric oxygen, oxygen therapy. Uh, interestingly, uh, considering now the uh, 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 some non uh, vitamin K antagonists have been approved for dialysis patients and apixaban, which has very little dependency on the renal elimination. Uh, question comes, should we you know, treat that thrombus of calciphylaxis with, uh, with non-vitamin K antagonists? At this point, no evidence, and we are not routinely anticoagulating these patients for specifically the indication of calciphylaxis. Of course, if the patient has another indication, such as non valvular AFib with high CHAD score, then we will use a non-vitamin K antagonist such as a Pixaban uh, for that patient's treatment. Hyperbaric oxygen, I think I have seen some really good results, especially for patients who have uh, distal calciphylaxis and those who are diabetic. So we routinely, not routinely, but we use it as a more like a second line treatment among patients who have, uh, who are not responding to the initial treatments with thiosulfate infusions. A debridement, I already mentioned this, so we'll skip over this. Um, uh, but can be quite effective and this particular patient uh, improved with debridement and subsequently received a skin a split uh, thickness skin graft and also this particular patient was also transplanted for kidneys and is now free of dialysis and luckily also calciphylaxis remains in complete remission. Debridement also has a role, unfortunately, uh, this picture is quite gross, but we receive referrals uh, of, of, with patients presenting with such severe lesions. And even in this patient, although the, the goal is not cure of calciphylaxis, but debridement can help in terms of improving the control of the pain 
and the requirement of the pain medications in the last few days of uh, uh, these patients. So to conclude, uh, I feel, you know, the uh, hopefully I've given you uh, some perspectives on the pathobiology and the epidemiology and the risk factors of calcifylaxis, uh, and seems to suggest that the epidemiology seems to be evolving. The disease historically was described only in the context of hyperparathyroidism, hypercalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, and even though, yes, those risk factors are important, uh, the more recent cases describe risk associations with conditions like exposure to warfarin therapy, for example, obesity, diabetes, uh, and this whole field of calcification inhibitors is quite exciting. Uh, no approved therapy for calcifylaxis, but um, uh, I think a multidisciplinary or inter interdisciplinary approach that includes uh, nephrology specialists, I think is, is something that is suggested. Uh, and I highly recommend you to also consider participation uh, in clinical trials uh, and registry studies. Uh, for, for patients with cases of access. So thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take um, questions if the time allows. Yeah, thank you very much. That was an outstanding integration of uh, basic science into a clinical problem that's plagued us for so long. There are a couple of questions, um, so I'll read them for you. Dr. Harris is wondering uh, about studies looking at modifying the dialysis prescription. Certainly, I can tell you in our um, our approach to this is that, that we intensify dialysis to at least five days a week. Um, so wondering what, what the, whether there are um, series or observational studies and what are your thoughts on this and using low calcium dialysate? Sure, no, that's a terrific uh, question, Dr. Harris. Um, um, uh, uh, we, uh, obviously for patients who have, uh, 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 you know, kind of let's say abnormalities like persistent hyperphosphatemia or hyperparathyroidism, uh, we uh, intensify their dialysis, you know, as, as frequent as five times a week. We are not routinely intensifying dialysis in all patients who develop calcifylaxis for a couple of reasons. One is, of course, in the, on, the, on this side of the border, uh, uh, as especially for outpatients, it's quite logistically challenging to get them to that frequency of dialysis, considering the commercial organizations that unfortunately control the dialysis prescription space. The second issue also has been the sodium thiosulfate uh, dosing. The medication is cleared with dialysis. So if um, then three times the dosing, three times uh, infusions of thiosulfate may not be sufficient for patients who are, who are getting five times a week of uh, hemodialysis, for example. We also, you know, uh, the, the dialysis, uh, frequent dialysis also becomes a barrier for other therapies like hyperbaric oxygen, for example, just logistically becomes quite challenging. In terms of evidence at present, at least we don't have uh, uh, clear evidence to such a support that intensifying dialysis for all patients with calcifylaxis is, is beneficial. There is one study that I know of, uh, which was conducted out of Kansas. It's a registry study that did look at not exactly the intensity of dialysis, but the, the KT over V as a, as, a, as a marker for adequacy of dialysis. And in that experience, it did not actually correlate with mortality of calcifylaxis in terms of the exposure as a, as a dialysis adequacy parameter. That, of course, does not address the specific question of whether we should intensify dialysis or not. So specifically, I think that we don't have the answer to that question. And I think it will be case by case basis. We routinely intensify dialysis for patients who have, uh, who have uh, indications like hyperphosphatemia, hyperparathyroidism, volume overload, but not do it for all patients who have calcifylaxis. Uh, the calcium dialysate, we routinely use low dialysate calcium in these patient populations. And I actually have a very, uh, I would say, uh, uh, high threshold to tolerate hypocalcemia in this patient population. So unless they are symptomatic or unless they have obvious QTC prolongation, we do not repeat uh, the calcium, uh, calcium via supplementation or via calcium dialysis. Great, thank you for that. There's a few other questions, uh, again, noting that uh, we have very low uh, mortality at uh, our centers here. Uh, we do use the combination that you talked about and we do use this highly intensified. And I believe um, Dr. Farah and others um, had published a, um, a series, but again, these are the reason that we do these studies with these rare diseases is that we learn from each other and the uh, overview. Uh, one of our senior fellows is asking um, whether you've seen cases of hypercalcemia associated with sodium thiosulfate. And, an, and an a, 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 a related question from um, one of our hemodialysis pharmacists is around whether or not supplementing vitamin K might be of benefit. So. Yeah, Have again, you seen hypercalcemia and vitamin K? 
Yeah, terrific questions. And uh, 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 thank you, Dr. Farah, for all your contributions. We have followed your work very closely and you bring up a good point. I think we should be learning from each other, especially surrounding the issues about dialysis adequacy and intensification of dialysis. In terms of the um, uh, vitamin K therapy, I feel that I mean, there is, of course, you know, I think reasonable biological rationale here to supplement with vitamin K. Uh, strictly speaking, though, um, uh, uh, we don't have sufficient data to say that, you know, routinely we should use vitamin K as a potential therapy uh, for, for calciphylaxis. One of the concerns we had while running the trial was, especially with the dose that we were using, will there be a concern for thrombosis uh, from, from, uh, from high doses of vitamin K? Um, uh, uh, hematology collaborator that we had on our study actually uh, highlighted to us that coagulation cascade has a lot of redundancies and it is almost impossible to over supplement with vitamin K and cause a thrombosis. Having said that, in this 26 patient trial, uh, one of our patients did develop hepatic thrombosis. And this patient was indeed randomized to the active intervention. So I am a little bit nervous in terms of the safety of this intervention. And at least in our protocol, we are not routinely supplementing vitamin K. Um, uh, and I, will, I get a little bit more nervous in terms of supplementation for those patients who are not therapeutically anticoagulated. So if somebody is already on apixaban for their valvular non-valvular right. AFib, uh, then, of course, the overall risk of thrombosis will be lower, and I think we may make a case for vitamin K supplementation. But I think the, the, the bottom line is, I, I think we need a little bit more data to, to, to kind of suggest uh, routine treatment with vitamin K. Hypercalcemia is not something we have seen with thiosulfate infusions. We have seen typically hypocalcemia. Uh, uh, so uh, it's interesting that you bring it up, uh, um, and potentially these patients may have other causes for, for hypercalcemia. Uh, so I will probably interrogate those before uh, 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 assigning the hypercalcemia as a side effect to sodium thiosulfate. But hypocalcemia, yes, we have seen that quite commonly. In, in right. And I, I mean, again, I think you alluded to it, but just the, um, routine recommendation of, of parathyroidectomy or only if it's hyper or not necessary because it's another you know incision inter intervention in a person who may or may not be able to heal well so what would be your thoughts yeah so um, i would i would say you know 10 15, 10 years ago or so when we initially started doing this work and in our clinical program at that time um, we did way more surgical parathyroidectomies for patients with calciphylaxis and at least on three or four different occasions i thought i almost got uh, quite burnt in that approach because uh, almost always patients develop severe hungry bone syndrome um, and severe hypocalcemia that required then high dose calcium supplementation, calcite trial initiation. And in two of those instances, actually patient developed new skin lesions of calciphylaxis. So we were a little bit concerned that, you know, those high doses of supplementation with calcium calcite trial could be more problematic. I also feel like you know, in many cases, we are able to now control uh, the severe hyperparathyroidism with medications. Uh, as a sinacalcate or itilcalcitide. So at this point in our clinical protocol, we are reserving surgical parathyroidectomy only for those patients who have refractory hyperpara, typically levels above 600, 700, despite the use of medications uh, and not routinely doing that uh, for all patients with calciphylaxis. Listen, thank you very, very much. We're just at the bottom of the hour. I want to respect your time uh, on the East Coast and uh, and everyone else, a really uh, excellent uh, overview of a rare, complex, but devastating condition. And uh, thank you. And I think you will certainly ensure and enable um, us to, as much as we can, to participate in registry studies or uh, other studies. So again, thank you for your time and, and for your insights. And to the thank audience so much. Um, as well. Thank you. Bye-bye.